The Kingdom of Cambodia, one of three nations within Indochina. The mysterious former jungle realm of the Khmer, who were based in Angkor, that was once the largest city in the world, features many fascinating stone sculptures of various gods. A fertile country and a friendly nation that appears to have forgotten its recent dramatic history that comprised French colonial times, Vietnamese occupation and the cruel rule of the Khmer Rouge. The former palaces of the gods have now been transformed into tourist attractions and regal splendor and shining pagodas indicate that a new era has begun. It's a country willing to forget its past and eager to enter into a bright and exciting future. Phnom Penh, the reawakened capital of Cambodia and former land of the Khmer. A wonderful sight with all the charm of a bygone age. Along with its temples and religious sanctuaries, the former Pearl of Asia has witnessed much suffering caused by war, famine and disease. The splendid royal palace is surrounded by a high wall. There was once a citadel here that was subsequently replaced by a palace constructed of timber. Today's stone structure was built in 1927. But during the rule of the Red Khmer, it fell into decay. Under the rule of King Sihanouk, the palace was returned to its former glory in 1991. Directly next to the king's residence is Cambodia's finest temple complex, the Wat Pre Kyo Morokat. The Silver Pagoda is at the heart of the complex. It resembles the Wat Pra Kyo in Bangkok. It's aptly named. Its internal floor is covered with 5,000 silver tiles, each weighing a kilogram. The altar is decorated with a life-size golden Buddha. At the rear of the Silver Pagoda is a replica of the Angkor Wat Temple. Surprisingly, no monks have ever lived within this monastery complex, and it's quite remarkable that the temple's many cultural treasures have survived. Around the pagoda are several small temples and royal stupas that contain the ashes of former Norodom kings. The decorations on the tombs feature an interesting number of both Buddhist and Hindu symbols. Between the stupas is a small open pavilion that contains an equestrian statue of King Norodom. Without a doubt, the royal palace and silver pagoda are this city's pride and joy and are of much historic and cultural interest. In the gardens, there's a reminder of the court ceremonies that were once held here. A splendid royal carriage pulled by huge elephants made of gypsum. Sizawat Key is a road that follows the Tonle Sap River for four kilometers. It's where most of Phnom Penh's tourists are to be found due to its numerous bars and restaurants. During the Festival of the Water Turn, this, the junction of the Tonle Sap and Mekong, is a place of much festivity. After the rainy season, the Tonle Sap changes its course. Then the king and his guests will be duly seated on a grandstand. Rowing teams and their followers from all over the country are an important part of the annual festival, when thousands of spectators cheer for their respective teams. 
The richly adorned and colorfully painted longboats take 65 oarsmen who stand, kneel, and sit within them. They train throughout the year, and before the event, each boat is blessed by monks. The Wat Una Lom Monastery is the center of Cambodian Buddhism. This is the home of the patriarch and around 200 monks. The monastery once contained more than 40 buildings that were either damaged or totally destroyed by the Red Khmer, including the precious Buddhist gallery. The temple complex was built in the 15th century before the Khmer left Angkor. Various unchanged wall reliefs depict numerous battle scenes. The name of the pagoda indicates that an unalom is stored here, a hair from Buddha's eyebrow, a precious sanctuary indeed. Due to the fear of theft, the pagoda is only open during the early hours of morning, so only early risers are able to visit it. The temple is visited by many faithful Buddhists who come here to pray for the fourth patriarch who was killed here by the Khmer Rouge. During the second half of the 19th century, Phnom Penh became a French colonial town with wide streets, shops, government buildings, hotels and villas, all in colonial style. Within its park-like surroundings, the Temple of the Blooming Lotus Blossom features perfect harmony with nature. The Wat Bodum is a tranquil oasis in the heart of the city. The tall outer columns and edges of the pitched roofs copy the Siamese style of the Ayutthaya epoch, combined with traditional local architecture. In common with traditional Buddhist architecture, numerous small colorful stupas surround the pagoda. They contain the ashes of high-ranking monks. The tallest and most elegant stupa commemorates a brother of King Norodom. His urn is stored here and is guarded by four monumental faces. The northern area of the city is inhabited by various immigrants, Chinese, Vietnamese, Siamese and Indian. In the middle of this district is the Saap Mei, the central market. It's all rather confusing and chaotic. In fact, it's so higgledy-piggledy that it's quite difficult to see the numerous items that are offered for sale, both inside and out. This Art Deco building was built by the French in 1937 and its four adjoining market halls point in all four directions of the compass. The market is a hive of activity with many people and much traffic. Close to the banks of the Tonle Sap is a 27 meter high hill that contains a special sanctuary from which the city derived its name. Wat Phnom. According to legend, in 1372, a woman named Pen came across four Buddha statues on the banks of the nearby river. She ordered that a hill be built on which would stand a pagoda that could store the statues. The settlement that developed around the temple was called Phnom Pen, or the Hill of Mrs. Pen. Both hill and temple became the city's main landmark. At weekends, many of the local people visit their city temple in order to have their fortune told or to pray for almost anything. 
colorfully decorated shrine behind the pagoda contains the smiling, benevolent image of the legendary Mrs. Penn. The golden statue next to a large floral clock on the southern side of the hill features King Caesar Watts, accompanied by three women who symbolize the three provinces that were regained during his reign. The mighty monument of independence is situated south of the palace district at the junction of two boulevards. The red colored monument is similar to that of an Angkor temple and commemorates France's independence. The Tuol Slang Museum features Cambodia's dramatic past. Following Pol Pot's rise to power, a torture chamber was built here. The cells and torture devices are only a hint of the cruelty that once took place here. Photographs of various terrified prisoners hang on the walls. It's believed that 20,000 prisoners were interrogated and tortured here by Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge. The regime selected its victims virtually at random. When the Vietnamese army eventually reached this prison, the dead were lying everywhere. Killing Fields was the name of the area outside the city where the regime's enemies were executed and thrown into common graves. The history of Cambodia is somewhat macabre. When the Americans demonstrated their awesome firepower during the Vietnam War, the city's inhabitants were at first grateful when the Khmer Rouge marched in in 1975. However, then the slaughter began. Wat Maha Montre, the ministerial monastery. This, one of the city's most interesting Wats, derived its name from a royal minister who suggested its construction. Phnom Penh contains more than 20 pagodas that were renovated following the devastation caused by the Pol Pot regime. This one is particularly impressive. The altar of the main temple is decorated with several seated Buddha figures and the walls contain descriptive images of the life of Buddha. Holy Nagas and the heads of gods protect the abundantly decorated entrance of the Golden Temple. Today, more than 300 monks and novices live in this monastery school. On the headland of the confluence of both the Tonle Sap and Mekong rivers are several small boats of the country's boat people. These people live on their tiny boats and earn their livelihood from fishing. Tonle Sap is the heart of Cambodia. Its most important lifeline being the Mekong, the longest river in Asia and the fifth longest river in the world. For more than 4,900 kilometers, it crosses China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Today, one of the most beautiful and interesting cities in Asia is gradually recovering from the tragic events of the past. It is as though Phnom Penh is now keen to enjoy everything that was forbidden during the Vietnam War and the savage rule of the Khmer Rouge.
Next, we travel north to Cambodia's ancient capital. The busy city is left behind and replaced by a fascinating landscape. At the foot of Phnom Udong Hill is a new pagoda district, the Vipassana Turak Buddhist Center, a project that will most likely last forever. Because Buddhists believe they can improve their karma by having further new sanctuaries, wealthy patrons donate large sums of money to the cause. The entrance is lined with towers that contain the large heads of demons that resemble those at Angkor Thom. The monks and nuns who live here plan to make this sanctuary as large as that of the old temple town of Angkor, with huge temples, water basins and gilded figures of the gods. Street donations, along with the help of voluntary workers, assist in assuring the future of this bold and highly enterprising scheme. In 1618, Udong became the capital of Cambodia for several years. Indeed, there were once hundreds of dwellings and temples around the hills of Udong. The hills were acquired by the monarchy, who had stupas built to contain the dead. Wild steps led to a wonderful view and the beauty of the surrounding landscape is plain to see in each direction. Despite the various stupas, cherries and shrines on the mountain of good fortune, there is nothing here of the splendor of the old capital city. In 1866, King Norodom was persuaded by the French to make Phnom Penh the capital of Cambodia for strategic reasons. More than 10,000 subjects followed their king to the junction of the Mekong and Tonle Sap, and Udong was abandoned and fell into decay. The fertile plains around Udong had been favored by the monarchy for many years. King Ang Jan was a powerful monarch who ruled in the middle of the 16th century. Following the loss of Angkor, he settled in this fertile area that is rich in water. As in Angkor, here water was also an important source of power. The king selected the sacred water that was vital for the survival of his subjects. Hostilities between various sovereigns were common, so the people needed a strong king who was able to rule over all. And the Portuguese and Spanish did much to have their missionary work authorized. The old garrison town of Longwak is only a few kilometers from the palace. Its entrance is guarded by stone lions and golden nagas flank the steep staircase that leads to the main temple. Because the army of King Ang Jan was based there, the town was thought to be secure, so people were attracted to settle nearby. In the town were two statues, Pre Ko and Pre Ken. Their sacred golden text was said to impart the wisdom and knowledge of the entire world. 
During one of the frequent attacks by the Siamese, both statues were taken to Ayutthaya, where the sacred texts were translated. Each day at the crack of dawn, people arrive from all four points of the compass at the harbor of the Tongle Sap River. They're about to embark on a journey on the Royal Express. The deck of this speedy boat is mainly crowded by tourists from all over the world. The adventurous journey to Simrihap takes about five hours. The boat leaves the harbor on schedule and travels slowly along the Sizawat Quay for several kilometers. The boat passes the important Troy Jangva Bridge. The busy road that leads across it travels to the peninsula and also to Angkor. The boat speeds up, and it's easy to see how it derived its name, the Royal Express. The riverbanks contain several settlements of the Cham tribe. Each day, around 250,000 Cham live in Cambodia. They came here from the kingdom of Champa that extended from the central Vietnamese coast to as far as southern Laos. The descendants of this proud people are also known as the Khmer Islam because originally the Cham were Hindu, but influenced by Muslim seafarers from Java and Sumatra, they subsequently converted to Islam. Although the Cham and Khmer tribes live peacefully together, mixed marriages are much frowned upon. After several hours, the river opens up into a huge area. We've arrived at the lake that also has the same name as the river. The Tongle Sap Lake seems to be without end. The melting snow in the mountains of Tibet raises the level of the Mekong River. The river would overflow dangerously if it were not for the Tongle Sap. It absorbs the extra water from the Mekong and directs it into the muddy lake, a huge, shallow and fertile area. The striking hill in Simrihap Bay comes into view and we duly make towards it. Local inhabitants are well used to the annual increase in the water level and even make their living from it. For wherever there's water, there is fish. The boat is maneuvered skillfully around many fertile islands. Soon we arrive at a small jetty in Sim Rehab Harbor. There's plenty of hustle and bustle here. A reception committee is ready and waiting. Tourist guides, porters, and hotel staff. Sim Rehap is a relatively small town, 315 kilometers north of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. Growing tourism is gradually creating a boom town here because Simrihap is close to Angkor, the ancient capital of a huge and mysterious jungle realm. Although this is the height of the tourist season, it's all very laid back. The relaxed atmosphere is also enjoyed by the king who has a residence here.
On the pleasant riverbanks of the Stong Sim Rehap, there is no sign of the event that gave the city its name. The place where the Siamese were defeated. The park and the old and honorable Grand Hotel d'Encore are a reminder of the legendary colonial times of the 1920s, when nobility from all over the world came here to holiday. Welcome to Atizang Nangko. The city also possesses a fine institution, Artisans Encore, an art school for young Cambodians. Here, artists to be learn the traditional skills of the Khmer. The project is designed to provide both girls and boys from rural areas with various artistic skills based on age-old traditions. The painting of divine images and gold leaf decoration, skills that would have fallen into oblivion if it had not been for the French. Thanks to them, the Cambodian government was able to establish a training center for stonemasons in 1992. Subsequent years saw further schools for woodcarvers, silk weavers, artists, wood varnishers, and many other specialists. It's been a highly successful project. In 1998, the European Union subsidized a three-year project for professional training at the school. Today, the school's creations are sold all over the world. Next, the temple district of Taprom. It was built by King Jayavarman and is dedicated to the god Shiva. The temples of Angkor are the remains of various religious buildings that were built by more than 10 kings of the Khmer realm between the 7th and 16th centuries AD. The Taprom Monastery was built in 1186 in honor of the king's mother and was the center of the health care of those times for the entire country. The fast-growing kapok trees grow quite tall and cover the impressive architecture beneath a thick covering of leaves. This is a good example of how the encroachment of the dense jungle vegetation has affected various buildings. And the pale and gigantic roots of the trees cling to the moss-covered walls of the temple complex. Everything is dominated by the encroachment of nature. This jungle temple is reminiscent of one described by Kipling in his Jungle Book. Nature usually claims back its own. Over the centuries, moss, lichen and ferns have covered the numerous walls, delicate reliefs, broken columns and stone objects that are scattered on the ground.
The monastery was once home to 5,000, including more than 2,000 monks and 615 female dancers. In addition, more than 66,000 men and women from the surrounding villages actively served the monastery. Well-preserved stone reliefs decorate the walls of the sanctuary and illustrate various stories. Stone figures located in niches indicate the artistry of those bygone times. Taprom demonstrates the fragility of man's creations compared to the constant forces of nature. The French explorer Mouot once described it as a melancholic monument of decay. The fishermen on the tributaries of the Tonle Sap live peacefully together in large families. They're not particularly interested in commerce or trade as their lives are dominated by Buddhism. Along the riverbanks are several plain wooden huts whose interiors are divided into a living room and cooking area plus sleeping quarters. Many families, including their household pets, live on small houseboats, perfect for those who appreciate an occasional change of scenery. Close to Simriap, the Tonle Sap Lake is a good place for a boat trip. Every six months, the direction of the water changes, an excuse for much celebration and festivity. In former times, the king of the day severed a ceremonial rope that spanned the river and thus awarded the water its freedom. This is a strange and fascinating world of floating villages, forests, and a countless variety of colorful birds. The floating villagers and their houseboats that move according to the water level are an intriguing sight. Chong Nis is situated in the harbour basin of Simriap. Ferry boats from Phnom Penh come here, a good source of income for the local tradesmen. Life here is dependent upon the watery landscape. Tonle Sap Lake contains an abundance of fish like nowhere else on earth, a fact much appreciated by the local fishermen. They've adapted their lifestyle to the constantly changing water level, and if necessary, the floating villages can easily be moved to another location. During the rainy season, the Mekong travels through to the Tonle Sap River and brings with it huge masses of water that increase the surface of the river sevenfold. For the local people, the Tonle Sap Lake provides water, a traffic route, flood control, food and also a home. The fishermen belong mainly to the nomadic tribe of Vietnamese people who move around the lake and live in various floating villages according to the time of year.
some of them also live in primitive dwellings alongside the roads of numerous dams. The Street of the Giants leads to the entrance of Angkor Tom, the fourth and final capital of the ancient Khmer realm, surrounded by a mighty defensive wall. From here, one can enter the inner royal city via a large southern gate that contains huge stone heads. The area was once inhabited by priests, functionaries and military men. The king once used this large city as the administrative center of his realm with palaces and temple complexes. At its zenith, more people lived here than in any other European city of the 20th century. It covers an area of over nine square kilometers. To the north of this area, there was once a palace of which only the terrace of the elephants has survived to the present day. Each of its once splendid wooden buildings has long since perished. The route leads through a huge stone gateway into the five inner courtyards of the palace complex. Again, nothing remains of the various wooden buildings that once stood here. Most of the temple pyramid that was once decorated with precious stones has been overrun by the jungle. Only the king was permitted to set foot on it. According to legend, each night at midnight, the king had a meeting within the temple's lower tower with a snake goddess who was in the form of a beautiful woman. Now there is a new attraction for the increasing numbers of visitors to the old temple town. A ride on the back of an elephant around the Bayon, a Buddhist temple that was never completed. It's quite an experience. From a distance, it looks like a strange structure in the middle of the jungle. However, closer inspection reveals it to be an architectural masterpiece that contains a large variety of rooms. The external walls of both galleries are decorated with impressive flat reliefs that illustrate the daily life of bygone times. The world of the Khmer people of the 12th and 13th centuries is featured as in a picture book, a sacred place in which they worship their king. But most impressive are the 200 huge smiling faces that are set in stone. Archaeologists believe that each of the faces depicts a bodhisattva, a being that has attained the highest level of enlightenment on the threshold of Nirvana. Twenty kilometers northeast of Angkor Thom are the remains of the ancient sanctuary of Banti Shre, also known as the Woman's Citadel. To many visitors to Cambodia, this unique and atmospheric temple site is the most impressive of all the country's historic monuments. The temple captivates not so much by its size, but by its exceptional charm. The sanctuary is also in extremely good condition. 
taking into account that these buildings are more than a thousand years old. Today, the Bantie Shri Temple is known for its magnificent decorations and filigree bas relief. The way in which this complex differs from many of Cambodia's other sacred sites is that this one was not ordered to be built by a king. In the 10th century, the Shiva temple was the exception to the rule as the Khmer usually favored a totally different design. Picturesque water lilies in the eastern and western moat of the complex augment the tranquil and idyllic atmosphere of this captivating temple site. A double wall follows the moats that once symbolized the oceans and enclosed the rectangular center of the sanctuary. Even though the temple does not contain any original elements within either its architecture or sculptures, its decoration is unique. Why Bantie Shri was forgotten and how long the buildings were hidden within the jungle is still a mystery. It was by accident that these ruins were discovered in 1914. It took decades for the buildings to be reconstructed. The decorative stonemasonry of the sanctuary's three central towers is considered to be a unique treasure that dates back to the Khmer period. In spite of numerous decorations on the walls, gables and friezes of the inner sanctuary, no two images are the same. Everywhere there are enchanting goddesses and dainty dancers surrounded by artistically arranged plant life. This place is an artistic highlight in the cultural history of the Khmer people. A visit to Cambodia would not be complete if one did not experience a traditional dance performance. Women perform the ancient Apsaras dance that also appears in various paintings on the temple walls of Angkor. Apsaras, the divine female dancers who once entertained the royal court. Angkor contains thousands of them. Even today, they battle against evil spirits and demons and triumph over them, driving them away. Various traditional religious dances are still performed by a number of female dancers. However, the royal court of old boasted no less than 3,000 of them. Under royal rule, the Apsara dancers performed solely for the royal court. But today, it's mainly for the tourists. How times change. The dances often feature the story of Sita, the wife of the mystic hero Rama. She was kidnapped by the demon king Ravana and later set free. The folk dancers describe the natural faith in daily life of the rural population. Ritual dancers associated with ceremonial acts.
The rice dance is extremely popular. It depicts daily work and bountiful harvests. There's also the cardamom dance, during which fruit is gathered for the production of tea. These folk dances are in stark contrast to the ones that were performed for the kings and are more dynamic and full of passion. They exude much joie de vivre. Each gesture has its own special meaning. Even the gracious movements of the fingers are full of expression. According to tradition, these dances are performed only by women. Classical Apsara dances and folk performances have always played an important role in the lives of both the royal household and the Khmer people. Angkor was built by King Suryavarman II in the 12th century. At that time, it was the largest city in the world and covered an area the size of Manhattan. The city's temple mountain of Angkor Wat is a veritable masterpiece of architecture and Khmer reliefs. It's also the largest sacred building in the world. The huge complex is dedicated to the Hindu goddess Vishnu and extends over a larger area than Rome's Vatican City. A water ditch fends off the hustle and bustle of the town. Only the stone temple buildings have remained of this once huge city. None of its wooden buildings have survived. Yet the city's sandstone has withstood the test of time. This large courtyard is surrounded by a labyrinth of corridors. Each of the walls contains artistic reliefs that feature the wonderful Apsara dances. The divine dancers were trained in the royal court and were only allowed to dance for the king. Many illustrations indicate their esteemed position in the royal court. It took 37 years to build this temple complex and it stood for a thousand. In the middle of this large courtyard are five multi-floored towers representing the five summits of Mount Meru, home of the Hindu gods and the center of the universe. There are still many questions that remain unanswered with regard to the purpose of this sacred building. Was it the country's largest temple, built in the largest city? Or did the king have a mausoleum built here? The latter seems to be the most likely, as only a chosen few were permitted to enter the temple complex. Along seemingly endless corridors are illustrations of ancient Hindu mythology. They extend for a hundred meters. Chieftains with horses and battle chariots and armor-clad soldiers brandishing spears. The battle between good and evil. Over the centuries, each of the Khmer kings regarded themselves as incarnations of Vishnu. Saras and Divas, female dancers and goddesses, adorn the walls of the sanctuary's inner courtyard. Eventually, the Khmer were defeated by their enemy, the Siamese. The city was conquered, and a golden era of culture came to an end. However, this architectural gem that was thought to have been lost now shines out once again in all of its splendor.
female dancers, majestic temple complexes and farmers who work peacefully in their paddy fields. The wounds of this country are gradually healing and a new spirit of hope is in the air. Cambodia is a country that is slowly awakening with a population that is willing to forget its past and now looks optimistically into a bright new future. After 30 years of strife and deprivation, this South Asian jungle realm is today a fine tourist destination. Friendly, natural and unspoilt.